Noche UFC. Grasso versus Shevchenko. It is Mexican Independence Day coming up this weekend. And the UFC is honoring that by going to Mexico City. No, they're staying in Las Vegas. But they are taking the opportunity to showcase a lot of the Mexican talent that there is in the UFC. And there is a lot of it. Uh, most notably, our straw weight champion, Alexa Grasso, who will be defending her title against Valentina Shevchenko, who's looking to get that title back. Hope you like that little Spanish soccer announcer impression you got in the intro there. Let's get right into this breakdown, though. I'm going to break down each of the fights and give my predictions, starting with a strawweight fight between Josephine Knutson and Marnik Mann. Josephine Knutson, the Swede, is the minus 700 favorite in this one. She is 6-0 in her career, making her UFC debut. Marnik Mann is 6-1, and one, and she is looking to rebound off her Dana White Contender Series KO loss to Bruno Brasil, where uh, she got brutally KO'd with a head kick. Knutson, from the film I watched on her, looks very athletic, good grappling. She just looks strong in there. And she's got a bit of kickboxing experience as well. So despite having one less career MMA fight than Marnik Mann, uh, she does have some fight experience elsewhere in addition to her six UFC fights. Uh, Josephine Knutson is the minus 700 favorite. I'm going to trust the odds here and take Knutson by decision. I think she's just a little better than Marnik Mann everywhere. Next up is a lightweight fight between Alex Reyes and Charlie Campbell. Alex Reyes is plus 340 in this fight. He is 0-1 in the UFC, 13-3 overall. Charlie Campbell is 0-1 in the UFC, 7-2 overall. You might recognize Charlie Campbell from his Dana White Contender Series fight with uh, Chris Duncan, possibly the most entertaining fight in Contender Series history. Back and forth, he wobbled Chris Duncan. I think he set a record for knockdowns in a round in that fight. Absolutely ridiculous what he was doing to Chris Duncan. And then out of nowhere, he just gets flatlined by Duncan after basically winning the every second of that fight. Campbell went ahead and got a KO in another promotion, and he's back in the, the UFC's umbrella in the UFC now, and he's trying to get a win against Alex Reyes, who has a decent record, 13-3. and three. You're looking at it like that's impressive. This man has not fought since 2017, though. And I think in the few months that I've been doing these breakdowns, that's the longest uh, gap in between fights. I mean, Crone Gracie seems like forever. I think he was still only four years. So that's absolutely insane. I honestly haven't really looked into what is explaining that gap from Alex Reyes. I mean, he's a lot... He's, pretty up there in age now in his late 30s. I think Charlie Campbell comes in here and starches him. Uh, you just can't take that amount of time off and expect to, like nothing happened. I'm taking Campbell by KO in this one. Next up is a featherweight fight between Tracy Cortez and Jasmine Jazdevicius. Tracy Cortez is 5-0 in her last five fights and is the slight favorite in this one at minus 125. Jasta Vicious is 4-1 in the last five and is a slight underdog. Pretty much pick them, though. Both of these two fighters are very well-rounded. Uh, Jasta Vicious comes in with a more grappling-heavy approach, uh, where Tracy is more of a pressure striker, I'd say. Um, just looking at these two in their recent fights, I think Jasta Vicious is going to come in a lot bigger than Tracy Cortez. She's got a couple inches on her. Uh, which when you're only 5'5", 5'6", 5'7", that's pretty significant. And I think she's just a bit lo bigger, wider as well, which is going to give her an edge in the grappling. Uh, we've seen Jess DeVicius out grapple Miranda Maverick now, who I think is a, a better grappler than Cortez. And I think this is going to be the biggest advantage for either fighter in this fight. Cortez doesn't really quite have the power, I think, to... Uh, get Jazz DeVicius to back off of her. So I, I expect Jazz DeVicius to pressure this whole fight and win by decision. But if you're feeling devious, Jazz DeVicius by finish has some very uh, 
very good looking odds as well. After that fight is a men's featherweight fight between Edgar Chires and Daniel Lacerda. Chires is the two and a half to one favorite in here, despite being 0-1 in his UFC career. Uh, he's 10-5 overall, Daniel Lacerda 11-5 overall, but he is 0-4 in the UFC. Uh, one of the, uh, yeah, I I did not expect Lacerda to be four in a row just watching his recent fights. He's a guy who's really explosive. Um, the fact that he's still looking for his first win, I mean, yeah, you, you saw I was speechless. I didn't even know what to say because the guy's got a lot of talent. He's a shoot-to-box product. Um, he's taken on a guy here at Edgar Chires who fought Tetsuro Tyra better than a lot of the guys we've seen fight Tyra. Um, he spent a lot of the fight off his back, though, and really his only offense he generated on the ground, at least, was just going for Hail Mary guillotines. I think this is actually a good opportunity for Lacerda to notch his first win in the UFC. Lacerda is super explosive. And uh, Chires has shown a willingness to stand up and, and bang on the feet, which I think benefits Lacerda a lot. So I think he gets a first round KO. If this one goes out of the first round, though, um, it could be a good live bet opportunity for Chires, even if Daniel Lacerda seems to be up on the cards because Lacerda does tend to gas a lot. Next up, we go to the middleweight division for a fight between Roman Kapilov and Josh Fremd. Kapilov is the big favorite in this one at minus 340. He's three and two in his last five fights. Fremd is also three and two in his last five and coming in at a plus 265 underdog. Kopilov, he's been making a lot of noise in the middleweight, middleweight division now and not just for looking like a juiced up giga version of Chase Uber, Hooper. Um, he's on a three fight KO streak and KOs are the quickest way to raise your stock in this game. And I think he's been showing people just how dangerous he is on the feet. He's got brilliant kicks. He's coming off a head kick knockout of uh, Hibero, I believe his name was. And he's got really accurate hands and a lot of power in his hands. Fremd does pose a threat on the ground here. He's got a few submission wins, and we've seen Kapilov struggle off his back, but I don't really see Fremd being able to take Kapilov and put him on his back, so I'm expecting a KO here. I'll call it second round. Um, I said second round in his last fight, and he ended up getting a KO there. So uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Kapilov's second round KO is the pick. Let's go. Let's say he gets another head kick too. Why not? Uh, Fremd is pretty tall though, so he's gonna have to get that lip, that leg up there pretty high. Moving along, we got straw weights fighting. Next is Lupi Godinez uh, of Mexico taking on Elise Reed. Lupi is the minus four forty favorite here. She is four and one in her last five fights. Elise is a three to one underdog, and she's three and two in her last five. Uh, again, like the first fight in the card, uh, like the first fight in the strawweight division between uh, Nutsin and Mann, I'm going to trust the odds here. Elise Reed has been finished a couple times as of late, and you don't like to see these fighters getting finished, especially this early in their career where Elise Reed, I think, has less than 10 fights on her resume. We've seen her get dominated on the ground by Sam Hughes and finished. Uh, I don't think Lupi finds a finish here, but I think she's well-rounded enough to dominate this one and have a pretty convincing unanimous decision win. We have another Mexican fighter being highlighted next up. It is Fernando, Fernando Padilla, and he's taking on Kyle Nelson. Padilla is the minus 250 favorite. He is 15 and four overall and one and all in the UFC. Kyle Nelson is the two to one underdog. He's two, two and one in his last five and 15 and four overall. Kyle Nelson, we know who he is. Um, I I feel like a, a Neil Magny comparison isn't too crazy here. He's a crafty vet. He knows how to use his grappling to stay out of danger and just try to mitigate risk in there. He tries to push you up on the cage. Um, he's not flashy, but he's definitely more methodical in his approach and 
fights pretty slow. And he's definitely got that crafty vet presence to him. But uh, Padilla just KO'd another crafty vet in Julian Arosa. And I think he does the same here. Padilla is only 26 years old. He's constantly improving. And he's coming in with a lot of fight experience. I mean, that's one thing I've noticed about these Mexican fighters. They have a lot of cage time. They have all, lots of them are under 25 years old or younger and come in with 14, 15 uh, plus fights on their career, which is a, a lot more than you tend to see from other uh, countries like uh, amateur rankings or whatever, amateur uh, promotions and whatnot. So they're coming in a lot more polished than let's say a guy, a guy from the US who's eight and now. So I think Padilla finds a finish here. He's got a long reach, he's got a lot of power and Cal Nelson's, Nelson does not have a great chin. Next up on the main card, yes, we have made it to the main card. I believe that Padilla fight was the first fight on the main card. Following it up is Daniel Zellhuber and he's going to be taking on Christos Yagos. Zell Huber is the minus 300 favorite in this one. He is 2-1 in the UFC, 13-1 overall. Christos Iagos is the underdog here, and he's 3-2 in his last five fights. 20-10 overall, though. Um, Zell Huber rebounded from a fight versus Trey Ogden that he lost, um, in which he looked just really tentative, did not bring it to Trey Ogden at all. And it was a fight that I think he disappointed a lot, but he rebounded and went in there against Lando Venata and dominated that fight, almost got a finish. Um, and he's definitely a guy who's shown a lot of promise. He's tall for the division and he knows how to use his reach and is he's looking for finishes. But he's taking on a guy in Giagos who's got 30 pro fights. 20 and 10, he wins 75% of his fights. That's pretty good. I mean, you're getting great odds on Kiagos here. I think the odds are a bit a bit inflated just because obviously Zell Huber is the Mexican fighter and he's the one being highlighted in this one. And Kiagos is coming off of fights versus Armand Sarukian and Tiago Moises, uh, who are two of the better fighters in the division. Um, so those finishes are definitely against high quality opponents but he rebounded most recently with a ko over ricky glenn so he represents a much different problem to solve for giagos he's a lot longer than ricky glenn a lot more spry he's younger more dangerous but i like the the odds we're getting on giagos here just with that massive uh experience advantage so i'm going to take christos by decision in this one Next up in the Bantamweight division, we have Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Terrence Mitchell. You know who Raul Rosas Jr. is. He's, at least at one point, was the youngest fighter in the promotion. I wanna say he still is. He's 18 years old. He is a massive favorite in this one at minus 750. Um, he's coming off a loss to Christian Rodriguez um, in which Christian Rodriguez really Dominated the grappling exchanges, which is Raul Rosas's bread and butter. Um, he's taking on a guy in Terrence Mitchell, who's 0-1 in the UFC, and he's a massive underdog. Not really anyone's giving him a chance in this one, and I am not giving him much of a chance really as well here. I think Raul Rosas's biggest issue was his strength in that Rodriguez fight. We saw C-Rod have uh, a similar grappling skill set and then he was just a lot stronger and and Raul, Raul Rosas just had really no answer for him I think he finds a submission in this one as well climbs on Terrence Mitchell's back in the first or second round and gets a rear naked choke to get the submission win so I mean plus 525 definitely juicy Terrence Mitchell is not a bum by any any means means but I think in terms of UFC talent, uh, Earl Rosas is just has the much better skill set here. Uh, so submission is going to be the pick. 
Our co-main event is a welterweight fight between Kevin Holland and JDM. Kevin Holland is the slight underdog here, and he is 3-2 in his last five. <clears throat> JDM is the minus 150 favorite, and he's 5-0 in his last five. I was expecting these odds to be a little bit closer than they are, like almost a pick em. And I think it started out this way, that way. And that's because JDM really got exposed in his most recent win versus uh, Basil Hafez. He showed major grappling weaknesses versus Hafez where he got taken down, had absolutely zero double leg defense to be seen. Um, it, he just did not look good. I mean, he, he landed a lot of hard shots on Hafez and showed some of the skills that have him so touted as a prospect. But um, the weaknesses really overshadowed any good he had in that performance. And then you have Kevin Holland, on the other hand, who went down to 170 and really revitalized his career. Um, he probably always was a 170-pounder, just never really made the switch committed to it from 185 where he was fighting guys who you could just tell were so much bigger so much stronger than him came down to 170 and got a few finishes fought a lot of tough guys and i mean kevin holland where to begin i mean he's a guy who i think if becoming champion was number one priority and and winning was the number one priority he's a guy who i think has all the skill set to be able to do that in the welterweight division. I wholeheartedly believe that. But when he's coming out and saying stuff like he's not interested in the title, that's not his MO, and he's getting defensive when people are asking him about it, that just, I don't know, it's, it's just a bit concerning. I don't question him as a competitor. I mean, I think he's going to come in there and give 100% every time. But still, if if the belt's not on your mind, I mean, what's really your motivation and what better motivation is there than to try and be the best? So that's what concerns me. And for that reason, I'm taking JDM to win this one. I think Kevin Holland has the grappling arsenal to take JDM down and fluster him on the ground and really expose JDM. But Holland hasn't shown a willingness to do that versus other guys like Wonder Boy, where I think everyone knows that, or everyone at least believes that Holland, if he committed to grappling in that fight, he could have won. But he just, uh, you know, wanted to go in there and bang. And you can't knock him for that. I mean, I, I definitely respect that. But I think that's just a tough game plan versus JDM here. So I think JDM's going to just win this one with his power and his clean boxing and gets a decision win here where he'll start looking for a top 15 fight. And then next for Kevin Holland, I have no idea. And then we have our main event. It is Alexa Grasso defending her featherweight belt versus Valentina Shevchenko. Grasso is the plus 140 underdog despite beating Valentina the first time around and Valentina is coming in at minus 166. And I'll just say that I'm kind of getting Leon versus Usman vibes in this one. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Alexa Grasso, we saw it, it had a similar narrative going into the fight. I mean, people thought Valentina was gonna dominate and we did see Valentina uh, I'm not going to say dominating, but winning a lot of the exchanges, especially in the second, third, and third rounds. We saw her grappling, Alexa Grasso taking her down at will. And then Alexa Grasso comes and out of nowhere gets this rear naked choke win. And a lot of people are quick to dismiss it as a fluke, a lucky uh, self-inflicted loss from Valentina Shevchenko going for like a spinning kick. But I, for one... Uh, think that Alexa Grasso was not given enough credit for the good things she did in that first fight. We saw her definitely hit Valentina a lot harder than Valentina was hitting her back. Um, she landed a couple shots that Valentina definitely looked like she was wobbled from. And yes, Valentina was 
landing a lot of great takedowns and Alexa Grasso benefited from um, the referee standing them up, them up when it probably was not warranted. But I mean, I think Valentina going and taking such a grappling heavy approach, uh, I think that kind of shows that she felt like she lost some confidence on the feet versus Grasso. I can't imagine that was the plan coming in, uh, especially when her going for takedown just came more and more obvious as the fight went on. She became more and more one dimensional. I think that's gonna give Alexa Grasso a mental edge going into this one, knowing that Valentina is not looking to stand in there and throw hands with, uh, with Alexa. Valentina is 35 years old. Um, this It was the second fight where she didn't look like, I guess, the Valentina of old who was just starching everyone. I think there's probably some truth to that. I mean, 35 kind of seems like that age where a lot of professional athletes seem to decline. They're, all the mileage, all the years seem to catch up to them around that age. And I also think it's just the competition catching up to her, her a little bit. Um, I think the women she was defending her belt against before her fight versus Tyler Santos and Alexa Grasso were not quite the best, but I mean, maybe Valentina really just was that good. There definitely was a six month year period where if you ask me, Valentina was the best fighter on the planet, but Valentina, Perhaps she's just not quite as locked in. I mean, she doesn't have a whole lot left to prove and just given her age, um, wouldn't shock me if she retired after this fight, truthfully. Um, you saw her like training in her J Japan for her last fight. I mean, she almost has this like nom nomadic training style that I just, I don't know if you can keep up with all that traveling, going around and training all over the world. Um, and just taking that approach. I just don't know how effective that is. But we'll see. I think Grasso gets a decision win in this one, just like we saw Leon do in the second fight versus Usman. So that's gonna be the pick. I'm really excited for that fight. I mean, anything can happen with those two, and I think it's gonna be a super exciting one. With that being said, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and you all have a beautiful weekend, great Mexican Independence Day if you will be celebrating that. Peace.